Let's put this room in outer space. Okay. And, and uh, let's put an astronaut on the, on, on, on the outside of the wall of the room. And there'll be a tiny gravitational force that attracts the astronaut to the center of the room because you're all sitting in the room. Okay. And, and, and you all have mass. Okay. And now if we start, instead of putting you into the room, start packing enormous densities of quark-gluon <laughs> plasmas into this room, well, the mass is going to be dramatically larger than what it is right now. And this astronaut on the other side of the wall, floating with this room through outer space, is going to feel attracted more strongly to the room. Okay. And let's crank up the mass even further. It becomes harder and harder for this astronaut to just jump off and jump off into outer space without being pulled back to the surface of the room. Just like it's hard for us to jump off the surface of the Earth. We always get pulled back. Gravity always gets you in the end. Well, it doesn't always get you in the end. If you jump fast enough, then, then you, can, you, can, uh, you can completely escape from the gravitational field of, of most bodies. Okay. And of course, there's nothing that's faster than the speed of light. Okay. So the problem is that if you crank up the density of the object high enough, that even light isn't fast enough to escape from this object, then you've made what's called a black hole. Okay. And that can happen as we increase the mass of this room more and more. Black holes come in all sizes. They don't have to be gigantic astrophysical black holes. Black holes can be as small as this room. Okay. And if you've put as much mass as about 1,000 times the mass of the Earth into this room, which is a lot, but it's the principle that matters here. Okay, you just squeeze. Um, then you'll find that nothing can escape from this room anymore, no matter how fast it goes. Light can't even escape. You've made something called a black hole. And a black hole is basically um, a region of space-time that's that's separated from the rest by what you can think of as a sort of membrane called the horizon. It's a one-way membrane. If you cross this horizon into this strongly gravitating region, there's no way out. Okay. Of course, if you stay safely outside, there's no problem. You're, 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 you're fine. Okay. But now we realize that we can't simply assume um, that, we can, that we can put as much mass as we, as we want to into a room. So it's two things working together. It's the uncertainty principle, which is something that comes from quantum mechanics, which tells us that information costs energy, that writing things in small letters costs more energy than writing it in big letters. So it means that we have to put in a lot of energy if we want to put in a lot of information into this room. And we're combining that with a lesson from gravity which is that you can't put as much energy as you want into a room. There's an upper limit. And putting those two things together tells us there is an upper limit on the amount of information that you can store in this room. Are there any questions about this? Yes. Maybe use the microphone. You actually said that um, there will become a black hole, and then you can add mass to the room. So what you're saying is that the room will grow because it's yeah. That's that, again. That's that's an excellent question. So a black hole. That's that. That's right. Because black holes are in some ways very simple systems. We know exactly what happens to them when you try to add more mass to them. Okay. And what happens is that the black hole radius, the radius of this horizon, this one-way membrane, will grow in proportion to the mass that the black hole has. Okay, so the, the relationship between the radius and the mass of a black hole is very simple. G is Newton's constant, M is the mass of the black hole, R is the radius of this one-way membrane that we call the horizon. Okay. So if you, add, if you now try to add more mass, you can't do that in a way that holds fixed the size of the region. And that was the one rule that we had in the game to start with. We want to specify the size of the region. Okay. You can't add mass to a black hole that's already as large as our room was 
without increasing, without, without increasing the size of the black hole and, and thus violating the rules that we set to start with. We were asking how much information fits in a region of a given size. No, you see that that's the point. It doesn't. It doesn't. So um, the no hair theorems that uh, that were alluded to in the introduction uh, tell us that the way that a black hole looks from the outside is completely independent to which in which order you threw things in and to what their what their consistency was. It settles very quickly down to a state that is characterized only by the mass of the stuff that you threw in. I mean, that's how it looks from the outside, but inside it will be this room and then empty space, right? Well, um, yeah, so this is, this is the first good question by the audience that I can't, that, that is not supposed to be answered right away. Um, but I can talk about this after, after I'm through with this line of argument. That, it's, it's a very good point. And in fact, in fact, my contribution to the subject comes mainly from asking precisely this question. So, so, so let, let me already maybe rephrase the question. What, what if we don't care about what this looks like from the outside, but we follow the room in as it collapses inside this black hole? There seems to be some, some conflict there, because there it looks like we have a certain amount of information, and it's just getting squeezed into a smaller and smaller volume as things collapse into a single point in the center of a black hole. But let's, let's, leave, that, let's leave that aside for now and do thermodynamics the way we usually do it. We specify some rules, and we stay outside the system and look at it from the outside. So what I've told you right now is basically a qualitative argument. Uh, putting together quantum mechanics, the fact that small resolution costs more energy, and gravity, the fact that in a given volume you can have only so much mass, no more than the mass of a black hole that would occupy that same volume. That from this we learn that there's, that there's some kind of cutoff on the amount of information. But we haven't learned w what is that cutoff. And it would seem that, again, if, if you if you operate naively and you just try to do many different examples, that it would depend on precisely which system you're studying. We could put a gas inside this room and crank up the temperature until it collapses to a black hole and ask, what is the entropy, which is really the, the technical phrase for this uh, information content that I'm talking about here. What is the entropy of the gas just before this collapse occurs, when I've maxed out the mass? I get one answer. And then I could fill this room with, I don't know, a bunch of elephants and squeeze them together more and more. And I'd get a different answer. Right. It's not clear that there is a universal answer that's, that's simple and elegant and is telling us anything deep. Okay. But actually, precisely the same mechanism that tells us that there is quantitatively a cutoff on the amount of information that we can have. Uh, is also giving us a hint about, uh, sorry, qualitatively, it's also giving us uh, a hint about the quantity of information we can at most expect to store in a region. And that, that kind of statement is, is a very interesting statement if it's really general and it doesn't depend on the kind of systems that we're assuming live in the region. Because it's telling us something about the complexity of nature at the most fundamental level. Independently of whether we're talking about elephants or quarks, And so now, um, now let me use probably the one thing that we know best so far about quantum gravity. Quantum gravity is still, is still a difficult subject. We know how to do a lot of things with, in, 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 in string theory. Uh, but we don't know very well, for example, how to do cosmology yet from a quantum point of view. Um, one thing we do know, thanks to some developments in the 70s, um, is the information content of an actual black hole. Okay. And this is again from the point of view of the outside. Okay. What we learned in the 70s is that a black hole has information in the same sense that this room contains information, the sense that we've been discussing all along. 
In this room, it corresponds to molecules moving this way or that way. In a black hole, we don't quite know actually what exactly it corresponds to, except in a few special cases where string theory tells us. But we do know pretty much for sure, as well as we know anything in this subject, that, that, that a black hole really should be assigned an information content. And we know that this information content is given by the surface area of this famous one-way membrane, the horizon of the black hole. So a big black hole contains more information than a small black hole. That's not so unusual. What's a little bit unusual is that the, the information content of this object grows not in proportion to its volume, but to its area. And by the way, the volume of a black hole isn't terribly well defined in the first place. So it's a good thing that it grows like something that we actually know how to define. Okay. Maybe let me say a few words, since I'm pretty good with time, about how people came up with this idea that, that black holes have, have an information content, that black holes have entropy, as we like to say. Okay. Um, the way that, that Jacob Beckenstein, as a graduate student, uh, came up with this um, was to ask the question, um, can we violate the famous second law of thermodynamics by throwing something into a black hole? Okay. So the second law of thermodynamics tells us that in any physical process, where we throw two systems together, or no matter what we do, the complexity of the final result is always greater than what we started with, the so-called entropy of it, the amount of things I have to specify to describe which exact state it's in. It's always greater than what I started with. It's like if I had all the gas in this room concentrated in one little corner, and then I removed the wall that kept it there. I've gone from a very simple state, comparatively speaking, to a very complicated one, where, where each of the molecules has, has many more different positions where it could be. Okay. But it seems like if I take this entire room and throw it into a big black hole, I've made the world a lot simpler. Right. I'd let you go first. But if you then throw the entire atmosphere of this room and the walls into the black hole, it looks like I've decreased the complexity of the total system, black hole plus room. Because the black hole, as we just learned, is a very simple system. It's described by nothing but mass and maybe charge and angular momentum. But not these billions and gazillions of tiny little objects that, that move this way or that way. It's a very simple thing. It's just a membrane of a certain size. So I've taken all this complication and thrown it into this black hole. And now from the outside observer's point of view, it's, it's, life has become very simple. Now, if the second law of thermodynamics is worth anything, it should be valid for any observer, including the guy who stays outside the black hole. And that's what suggested to Beckenstein that there's an, an implicit assumption here that must be wrong, which is that the black hole itself has no complexity. Now, classically, it has no complexity, but there's still room because it could have some complexity quantum mechanically in some quantum theory of gravity that we haven't discovered yet. And so by this indirect argument, we're learning something about this quantum theory of gravity that we want to discover. We're learning that when I throw something into a black hole, here's our room, that something should change in this black hole. And that change should make up for the lost entropy of the room. Now, Hawking had proved a theorem around the same time. This theorem stated that in any process involving black holes, the area of the horizon can only ever increase, but not decrease. That sounds awfully like the second law of thermodynamics with, with entropy replaced by area. Okay. There aren't that many things in nature that can only ever increase. And so Beckenstein said very simply, well, let's just suppose that the entropy or information content of a black hole is equal to its area measured in some suitable units that are constructed out of uh, the, the Newton's constant that measures the strength of gravity and, and Planck's constant that tells us the size of a quantum. Okay. Now this, this quantity is supposed to be the entropy of a black hole. That was the new step. And it turns out that when you throw something into a black hole, the mass of the black hole grows. The radius of the horizon grows. Therefore, the area grows. And so there's something available that, that could have increased the total entropy, even though this, this information here was completely lost. Okay. As long as the area grows by enough, 
to make up for, for the entropy that was lost when we threw this, this system into the black hole. Okay. Well, that was a pretty wild conjecture to start with. Um, but it, 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 it held up in so many different ways that now we're pretty convinced it must be true. If a system like a black hole has mass and it has entropy, you can show that it must also have temperature. And in a completely different way, a completely different line of argument, Hawking later discovered that black holes really radiate as if they had a temperature of precisely the value that is required by Bekenstein's conjecture that, that black holes also have, have entropy. Okay, so things, things started fitting together. Much later in string theory for some special black holes, people were actually able to calculate what makes up for all this information content of a black hole in quantum gravity. What's, what's underneath this smooth classical surface that looks like, it, like there's, there's nothing that can wiggle around. And, they, and, and people calculated what is the entropy of a black hole. Really starting from, just like we would starting from, from individual molecules in this room, they calculated it from, from individual constituents that quantum mechanically make up this black hole. And they came up exactly with the same answer as Bekenstein. So we believe pretty strongly by now that, that this is really true, that a black hole is a complex system with, with an information content equal to its surface area measured in units of the Planck length squared. So you can imagine tiling this horizon with little Planck tiles. This Planck length is very short. It's about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's you know, some finite length scale. And to describe the state of a black hole exactly, I could, I could write little zeros and ones on these, on these tiles. And you know, the different states it can be in correspond to the different ways I can fill these tiles with zeros and ones. Very similar to the different states of this room corresponding to different ways in which I send tiny little molecules moving this way or that way. Okay. Each tile is a letter. So now let's, let's be confident, let's believe that, that the area of the horizon really is the correct way to measure the entropy of a black hole. Too many things have, 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 have already come together and worked out for this to be wrong. And let's go the other way now. Instead of wailing about the fact that the second law of thermodynamics is apparently violated when you don't assign an entropy to black holes, Let's use the fact that black holes have, have this entropy and assume that the second law of thermodynamics is true, that entropy always increases, complexity always increases in any process. Well, then we can use that to learn something about the complexity of ordinary matter systems that we throw into a black hole or that we convert into a black hole. So let's just go back to our old picture of having this room floating somewhere in outer space and cramming more and more mass into it. Increasing the, amount, the information content in the room until we get to the point where the room suddenly collapses into a black hole. Let's do this in a way so we make sure that the black hole has surface area um, no larger than, than the size of the initial room. Okay, so, so let's convert the room by adding more and more mass to it into a black hole of the same surface area. Let's not worry about rectangular versus spherical. Those are subtleties. Okay, it's a spherical room. Um, okay. And you can just think of that as just another one of these famous physical processes in which the complexity can only increase. The nice thing is that you know the final complexity. I've just told you, we have a black hole at the end. And the number of letters it has is measured by the area of this surface, of this, of this, of this event horizon. Okay. And so the number of letters we needed to describe the system we started with has to be less than or equal to that by the second law. 